Welcome to episode 13 of SpaceX in the News. Another week has come and gone, and once again, SpaceX has managed to deliver a buttload of information for us to go over. We're gonna start with the recent tests of the Raptor engine, and then we'll talk about Starhopper and the construction going on over there in Boca Chica. Of course, we'll talk about Starship. We'll briefly mention Mr. Stevens' journey to the East Coast, some upgrades to Pad 39A, and of course, this week's honorable mention. Let's get started. So on September 26 of 2016, SpaceX fired their first mini prototype of the Raptor engine for the first time. It was a successful test and they fired it as long as they could using up all the fuel in the given tanks. Fast forward just a couple years later and just this weekend Elon was in McGregor, Texas to witness the first static test of their newly redesigned Raptor engine. Over the course of the next several days, the engineers tested the engine three to five more times, progressively ramping up the throttle with each test, until Elon tweeted on February 7th that the Raptor achieved the power level needed for Starship and Super Heavy. For those of you that like specifics, Elon even tweeted out the impressive numbers. The design requires at least 170 metric tons of force to work. Engine reached 172 metric tons and 257 bar with warm propellant, which means 10% to 20% more with deep cryo. And what he means by that is the cooler you freeze these fuels, the more you can actually push through the engine at one time, giving it more thrust. Not only did the engineers over at SpaceX do a really good job retooling this thing, but they did it fast. This engine is more than double the power of the Merlin engine, which takes the Falcon 9 to space. So of course I'm impressed, you know, I'm amazed, and if any SpaceX employees are watching this, congratulations on this awesome feat. You know, I have this good feeling that this huge milestone has been passed now, and hopefully the snowball will start rolling downhill, gathering momentum, so we can get these engines on Starhopper, Starhopper can do its tests, Starship can start progressing, and not just one Starship, two Starships. And then we can do the Starship and Super Heavy all up test in 2020. I am really pumped, you guys. But, but let me pump the brakes a little bit on myself because I want to get back to Starhopper before we move on to Starship. So I've got this contact. A lot of you probably know of her. She goes by Boca Chica Maria, and she is the nicest lady ever. I was just on social media the other day, and I just wanted to quickly ask, what's been going on at the Starhopper site? Because I haven't really heard much. You know, that's just because Southern Texas has had pretty bad weather lately. But, you know, she was so cool and so nice. She replied with this long, detailed description of everything that's been going on at the site. And one thing that I'd like to point out that she wrote is that two shifts are working on Starhopper right now, and she's looking pretty solid. Less dimples, solid sounding on the metal when pounded, and hoses and cables always being threaded into the portals. You can see what she's talking about in some of these pictures that she took right here. And also according to Boca Chica Maria, who obviously is a local, she just lives right down the road from the construction site, cement and gravel trucks have been coming in all week to the launch pad. And there's plenty of evidence in the video and photos she's been sharing. And furthermore, another local back in January, Austin Barnard, took aerial pictures of the launch site, and then just 10 days later, he took them again, and you can see the improvement being done. I mean, if it's not obvious to everybody now, Elon is not messing around. He's got these guys working all day, rain or shine. So if any of those guys are watching this video, keep up the hard work, guys. We all sincerely appreciate it. You know, we're all just so excited to see this big star hopper get off the ground and shake the windows of Boca Chica Maria's house. But don't break them, of course, you know, be cool. Now transitioning to Starship, just the other day, Everyday Astronaut tweeted to Elon, how will the booster support its own and Starship's weight when it's unfueled? It won't have a chest plate of sweaty stainless steel like the Starship will, right? Will it need some kind of backbone or internal structure to remain structurally stable when unpressurized? And what Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut's referring to is that because stainless steel can buckle when unpressurized, even though Elon's creating a more sturdy alloy, the windward portion of Starship will actually be double layered where the heat shield goes. So this heat shield technology will actually stand in as a structural support for the weight of the Starship. But what about the super heavy booster that's not double layered in any specific spot? Will it be able to hold the weight of Starship and not buckle? And to which Elon replied, welded internal longitudinal hat stringers will be added to the degree it may need hoop stiffness combined with slosh bafflers. So if you don't know what hat stringers are or skin stringers, Basically, it's the same kind of technology or internal support structures that they use on airplanes and also in some previous rockets. Basically, they're just metal bars that act like ribs that run down the fuselage of an airplane or you know, the body of a rocket. And slosh baffles are just like little walls that go inside the fuel tanks that keep the fuel from sloshing back and forth against the inside of the rocket 
you know, minimizing the amount of force they put on those walls. And maybe also kind of acting like internal support structures like hat stringers. Another Twitter user asked Elon if he still plans on having super heavy land back on the launch pad from which it takes off. To which Elon responded, it'd probably be wise for version one to have legs or we'll frag a lot of launch pads or blow them up. Elon has said in the past that they've been landing these Falcon 9 boosters so accurately that by the time it comes to launching a super heavy booster, they should be able to land it back on the launch mount where it actually you know, took off. But I think Elon's getting a little skittish now because since he said these things, the development for Starship and Super Heavy has rapidly progressed. You know, at the time, not even Elon knew we were gonna be where we are today. He only knew that we were gonna be this far along after he realized that he should go with stainless steel rather than carbon fiber. And stainless steel allows him to really pick up the pace with Starship and Super Heavy development. So at least for the first version of the Super Heavy booster, Elon has said that he plans on possibly making the three fins for Starship actually the bottom part of Super Heavy as well. So instead of landing on a launch pad, it will land on a landing pad like a Falcon 9 booster, but land like Starship will on these three gigantic fins. Of course, that's subject to change. And ironically, we're all well aware that the one constant lately has been change. It was also asked of Elon if Super Heavy would come in like a Falcon 9 booster, you know, engines first, or if it's gonna have these three fins like Starship, if it would come in belly first like Starship, even though it doesn't have a heat shield. And Elon replied no, because of the center of mass, it's gonna come in engines first like the Falcon 9 boosters. All right, so let's talk about Mr. Steven again. So last weekend, I mentioned that he's on his way to the East Coast because he's just gonna get way more attempts at catching fairings over there, which is important because we need to keep in mind to make this whole system of catching fairings and saving them and reusing them to save $6 million, we need to keep this economically viable. So we're digging this hole and we're digging this hole and SpaceX is throwing more money in it every time they attempt to catch a fairing. So there is some sort of unannounced, unofficial timeline that where if SpaceX crosses it without any successful fairing catches, then they're just gonna have to nix the program because they would spend more money on this recovery system than the amount they would save with all the fairings they would end up catching before phasing out these rockets. So Mr. Steven is booking it to the East Coast. He's gone through the Panama Canal. He was photographed by a local with fairings stowed away on the deck and he's made it through the canal and he should be on the East Coast by Saturday. Okay, so the Falcon Heavy. Were you aware that the other day, February 6th, was the one year anniversary of the maiden flight? Can you believe it's already been a year? I can't. I can still clearly remember my feelings and emotions as I watched that beast take off from the launch pad. It also helps my memory that I recorded myself watching it. Yeah, it's kind of sad after years of anticipation, I had to watch it from home live on my computer, but you know what? It was, it was still a great experience. I, I loved every second of it. Um, let me know down in the comments, where were you when you watched this flight? Were you at home? Were you lucky enough to be at this, at this launch? It's something that's on my bucket list for sure. And I would love to say with hundred percent certainty that I will be there to watch, you know, the Starship super heavy launch, but obviously, you know, tomorrow's not even guaranteed for any of us. Whoa, that's morbid. And yeah, how do you think things have gone since Falcon Heavy's first flight? You think things have been mostly positive and good? Do you think there's been some negative in there? I think almost the entire process with SpaceX since the Falcon Heavy took off has been just rapid progression in a positive way. Of course, they've had their minor setbacks with small things like a half a rocket tipping over because of wind, or or you had those layoffs, the 10% layoffs SpaceX recently did with their engineers. But it, I think I think all of it points to the future and progress because if you check SpaceX's website right now, you'll see just tons of jobs that they're trying to fill. So I think the future is bright, and if you want to be a part of that bright future there's your opportunity <laughs> apply now and speaking of progress and more good news have you checked out pad 39a lately over the summer when spacex installed this jetsons looking walkway i kind of laughed at it to be honest because i was like one of these things does not belong but check it now they are really upgrading that structure now as of right now you can see through it to the elevator shaft but i feel like i remember at one point reading that they actually plan on closing up the sides of that tower you know and it really makes me wonder how exactly they're building this to make it structurally sound to the point where it actually can withstand such impressive forces when these rockets take off i mean i'm sure you remember how much exhaust there was coming out of the falcon heavy's engines when that sucker lifted off and if starship lifts off from that thing holy cow and we just saw one engine firing. Can you imagine 31 of those things? It's gonna knock the earth off its axis. But I guess we don't really need to worry about that yet. What we do need to worry about is the Crew Dragon flight. 
Here's to hoping it's going to take off on March 2nd like it's currently planned to. A lot of you know this thing has been delayed week after week after week, which is fine. We all want SpaceX to do what they need to do to make sure this is successful. But at the same time, I really want this thing to launch. I mean, just take a look at this sweet, elegant picture. If this doesn't get your pulse pumping, then you're clinically dead or a vampire. And because the maiden flight of Crew Dragon has been pushed back to early March, some people are starting to fear that it may actually interfere with Falcon Heavy's next flight. You know, that's scheduled for March 7th, just five days later. Will SpaceX crew and technicians be able to restore that launch pad in just five days? It's certainly possible. Falcon Heavy is another vehicle that was supposed to launch last year. It's been delayed several months time and time again, and I'm sure ArabSat, their client, is just itching to get that thing in the sky. But check this out. This is very interesting. In May of 2018, the president of SpaceX, Gwen Shotwell, stated that they planned on launching 18 rockets in 2019. But just the other day, SpaceX vice president of commercial sales, Jonathan Hoffeller, announced that the company will try to break the launch record it set last year at 21 successful missions. Well, if SpaceX is going to try to break last year's record of 21 launches, and Gwen said that they're going to do 18 this year, that can't be right. There must be more on the books that they're not releasing yet. What could these launches possibly be? Well, most people that know about this have kind of come to a consensus that it's going to be Starlink launches. Yeah, Starlink. Now, this is not my speculation. This is speculation of everyone else. But wouldn't that be cool? Not only would we have awesome progress on the Starship front, but now we may also see progress on Starlink. That would be exciting. Okay, time to close this video out with this week's honorable mention. So last week, a couple of you commented that you would like to know more about SpaceX's payload for their next launch. So I thought it'd be convenient to do this week's honorable mention on Israel's moon lander. So trying to find more information about it, I came across an article by the Planetary Society conveniently titled, Here's Almost Everything You Need to Know About Israel's Moon Lander. So this moon lander project actually started off as a contest that Google was putting on but eventually decided to cancel because no one was making enough progress. However, this company, Space IL, which is a privately funded Israeli nonprofit, continued to design and build this four-legged lander. The craft, which weighs less than 200 kilograms or 440 pounds without fuel, will send home some high-definition pictures and video before hopping to a new landing spot half a kilometer away. If successful, the mission will make Israel the fourth country to soft land on the moon, following Russia, USA, and China. So their missions, aside from actually landing on the moon, is to create a new Apollo effect to inspire the next generation in Israel and around the world to think differently about science, engineering, technology, and math. However, NASA has decided to back them up and also do some scientific study with their mission. NASA will be able to precisely locate the spacecraft on the lunar surface using an instrument called a retroreflector, which reflects laser beams. And this lunar lander is not the only payload for this Falcon 9 rocket. Once in geosynchronous orbit around the Earth, the lander and two other spacecraft will detach, and then the lunar lander will make a TLI into the moon's gravity, doing a couple orbits before landing on the surface. This whole trip's supposed to take a couple months, so it's not actually supposed to land on the surface of the moon until late April sometime. Well, that's all I got for you guys this week. I hope you enjoyed it and found it informative. If you did, make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss a future episode. I can confidently say I'm going to be releasing these every week for the foreseeable future. So join the family. Thanks for watching. Godspeed.